Hello, everyone, and welcome to this aligned presentation on the 10 legal considerations for starting and running a medical practice. I am Jacob Stein. I'm an attorney in Los Angeles. And with me is uh, Suzanne Nadboni, who is also an attorney in Los Angeles. And Suzanne and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, Suzanne is an, a counsel to our law firm. And we have somewhat different practice areas. While my practice focuses primarily on private wealth work, and we'll talk about that a bit later, uh, things like asset protection and estate planning, Suzanne's practice uh, focuses largely on healthcare. Suzanne represents uh, lots of doctors, uh, various medical groups, surgery centers, and the like on all sorts of issues uh, related to medical practices, uh, transactional issues like uh, entering into various contractual uh, agreements, hiring staff, various regulatory and compliance issues, dispute resolutions. So very, very heavy uh, focus on uh, all aspects of healthcare law. And what's interesting about Suzanne is that uh, she's a very business-oriented lawyer. She is an entrepreneur outside of her practice of law. So she understands how businesses work, and she takes a very business-minded approach to helping her uh, physician clients run their practices. And Suzanne is finally also a general counsel to the Beverly Hills Rejuvenation Center, which is a multi-state med spa. Uh, she has garnered all sorts of awards uh, in the legal space, she is rated AV preeminent by Martindale Hubble, which is the highest possible rating a lawyer can have, and lots and lots of other awards. And on top of that, she's also an awesome person. So Suzanne will speak to you guys first on the subject of kind of more regulatory and business considerations and starting uh, and running a medical practice. And then I will take over towards the end and talk about some uh, estate planning and asset protection issues for doctors. So Suzanne, if you are ready, uh, please take it from here. Thank you so much for that introduction, Jacob. I really appreciate it. And good morning, everybody, to all the attendees out there. I'm going to go over the first seven points of this presentation, and then Jacob will go over the final three. And he's already given you a little bit of information about my background, and so I will um, bring that up when it comes up during this presentation. So I first wanted to mention that I've done some other uh, relevant publications and speaking engagements, which you can find more information about on this, on this topic that I'm going to be discussing this morning. For example, um, for doctors who want to um, have patient videos online, I wrote an article that was in the American Society of Healthcare Risk Management about um, special permission that you need to get, not only just for you know, typical entertainment law releases, but your HIPAA release. And then I also wrote an article that's on Alliance website about mobile health issues um, when using um, mobile phones and also related to HIPAA compliance. And then another article, uh, actually was a book, a chapter of a book on complementary and alternative medicine for use um, with psychiatry, but it could be relevant to other practice areas as well. And then um, speaking engagements, I've discussed business law issues, crisis management, and then um, connecting with millennials in relation to one of uh, my own businesses. And so you can find more information about that online, and you can email me if you would like a copy of these uh, PowerPoint slides at the end. <clears throat> so uh, an overview is that I'm going to t discuss limiting your liability, and then Jacob will go into more, more into that later, and then supervision, uh, supervision issues, compensation, Contracts 101, Intellectual Property, Marketing, Legal Issues, and How to Avoid Disputes. And so we will go into, a, oh, disclaimer. Um, I have been to a lot of medical conferences, and they all have their, the doctors do disclosures, lawyers do disclaimers. So I just have to say my presentation does not constitute legal advice. It's for informational purposes only. And uh, the disclosures, as you already know, I'm of counsel to Alliance and of counsel to Marino Yabri and uh, president of my own firm, Alvin Wynn, and I'm the founder of an online legal resource database, LawTake, and working on a patent pe pending medical device um, listing to it and general counsel for Beverly Hills Rejuvenation Center. And my um, information that I convey during this presentation is only um, my opinion is not re reflected on any of those entities. So I will talk about now limiting your liability now that I've limited mine. Um, 
First of all, when you're going to start your medical practice, you need to consider which type of entity. Um, it, this is just for any business, and many doctors don't understand that California does not allow you to practice out of an LLC. I actually just had a client uh, run into this issue. So you either have to have a professional medical corporation or um, have you know run, run your business as a solo practitioner or a partnership. But the problem with those is that you don't have the limited liability um, between yourself and others if there was some sort of malpractice issue or other, other issues. So definitely consider which type of entity and put in the proper contracts in place. Um, for example, the shareholder agreement uh, between your, your doctors. And then also just many people don't realize that in a professional medical corporation, the doctors have to own 51% and then it can be up to 49% of allied health professionals. So I had one of my clients ask me, can he partner up with me to do his medical spot? No, I can't, sorry. Not that way, I can't be the 49% shareholder. But um, if I was an RN or um, an MFT or a chiropractor, then I could, but I'm not. So. You need to think about um, the ownership issues and then the contracts that you're going to put in place, and then also, obviously, what documents you need to file, the registered agent, taxes, um, permits. There's a really good, there's a couple of really good resources online. CalGold, I put up there. Um, it'll tell you if you put in the type of business, obviously, a physician, and then the location, what permits you may need, which you may need to still talk to a lawyer because a lot of them may not be relevant to your practice. And then, um, do you need a fictitious name permit? That's really big in medical. Um, you can't just be, you know, calling yourself um, beautiful aesthetics and, you know, you're a doctor. You need to have a fictitious name per permit for that type of name. And then um, if you're going to be selling items out of your practice, you may need a seller's permit. And then um, other issues, which I'll talk a little bit about later, are um, whether or not the people you hire are going to be independent contractors or employees, and obviously limiting your liability by having proper contracts. But I will come. In, I will go into that later. So then, um, supervision issues um, in relation to those people that you hire. If you're going to be hiring, uh, in you know, physician assistants or nurse practitioners, RNs, you need to have the delegation of services or standardized procedures in place. You are. You have to guide, direct, oversee, inspect, and evaluate. And um, there is a really good uh, patient safety story about this Dr. Garrison. It's like 140 pages put out by the medical board. And Dr. Garrison, I guess, had about 14 different clinics and was hardly ever there. He had a manager who was not a doctor, who was a layperson. And um, there were the, the, the standardized procedures and protocol were not very thorough. They, I put up 11 different things that, they should, that should be included, and they just were very um, deficient. So you want to have those reviewed. I've seen um, some from some of my clients that just were kind of, um, they weren't properly organized. They were missing some of these things. And so definitely um, take into consideration of those things, because if you ever get a medical board complaint, that's what they're going to look at. Um, and so that's that. Um, there's also, actually, I just want to say one other thing is there's limitations on how many you can supervise. So if somebody asks you to be a medical director, and you should definitely, you know, uh, use caution before doing that and make sure it's all properly structured. But also, there's a limitation on how many PAs that you can supervise. So look into that. Um, then the next issue, compensation issues. Um, <clears throat> if you're going to, many of my clients are, are cash-based. They're not utilizing government-funded services. But if you are, then you need to look to see if there are any um, you know, safe harbor. This is all about anti-kickback. We don't want um, the government does not want to make uh, you to make referral fees or have uh, self-interest, self-feeling types of payment structures. So, even if you are not utilizing government-funded services, the California Business and Professions Code um, 650 and their other state laws talks about fee splitting and the exceptions. Um, another one is the TORA Physician Ownership and Referral Act. So. Just a lot of people, they, they kind of generally understand these rules, but they don't really know that the nuts and bolts. And so I have um, put up a slide here. And so this is uh, Business and Professions Code 650, and it prohibits the offer, delivery, receipt, or acceptance by any licensed person of any rebate, refund, commission, preference, patronage, 
dividend, discount, or other consideration, when, whether in the form of money or otherwise, as compensation or inducement for referring patients, clients, or customers to any person. However, there is an exception if the consideration is commensurate with the value of the services furnished or with the fair rental value. So this comes up, um, I see this when they provide their employment agreements to me, and it talks about, oh, they'll get a bonus based on um, percentage of uh, uh, you know, pay money from patients, and um, it really needs to be based on productivity instead. Or um, sometimes you can do management services agreements, which is um, when I, which I mentioned earlier, when um, you're structuring your entity, you have to have a professional medical corporation. But you could also contract with a management services organization through creating a management services agreement, and in that management services agreement is where. Some of these issues comes up because they're not you're not paying fair market value and it looks too much like you're splitting fees with the uh, lay person and this is also related to the corporate practice of medicine we do, we want doctors to make medical decisions and so that's why they have to have the you know professional medical group and they contract with the lay person and not the lay person is not who has the management services organization is not making these um, medical decisions that affect patient care Um, so now I'm going to go into contracts 101, and um, I've already talked a lot about some, you know, contracts um, that you know you could have in place with your medical practice. But here are some more, and I'll just mention some examples of how some of these issues come up. Um, so, for for example, the patient intake sheet. There's um, I've seen some ones that really weren't even were were done by non-healthcare lawyers or just lawyers that put in release terms when there's no there's no issue of a release needed at that point, so I had to take that out. Um, the informed consents have been um, insufficient. The FDA it puts out really good information on a lot of different um, procedures, and you can check the FDA's website for warnings, and this should probably go in your informed consent in an abundance of caution. Um, so you know you you can talk to your counsel about whether or not you you think that that would scare a patient off, but I think that it's probably better to include it. And so um, then you have notice and disclosure documents. Um, those you should all have all these in place. Sometimes you get these templates from um, online or from your malpractice insurer, but they need to be tailored to your practice. And then. Um, like I was talking about before, the management services agreement. If you decide to delegate your um, the, the management administration um, services, so you keep your medical practice separate, then that would all be encompassed in this management services agreement. Then um, you obviously have the uh, agreements between your staff, and so those look like either usually an offer letter, employment agreement, or an independent contractor agreement. And um, a lot of people ask me, you know, what's the difference? I actually had a physician say, you know, I want this employment agreement, and I, I, I want to keep them on for one year, but I want to be able to terminate at any time. So it's not at will if there's obviously a term. So if, it's, if you want to be able to terminate at will, which is usually good if you've never worked with that person before, then do an offer letter after they've been working for you for, a, you know, maybe 90 days at least then um, you can offer an employment agreement if you want them to stay on for a year or longer. And um, maybe you're hiring a doctor. And if you're going to hire a doctor and you're going to have an employment agreement, um, you obviously may want them to work for a year. But what if they're not doing a good job? What if they have you know, their license revoked? You want to be able to terminate for cause. And so all of that needs to be laid out in the contract. And um, maybe you want to offer 30 days um, notice. Uh, you know, or would like 30 days notice if you want to terminate early absent some other more egregious breach of the contract. Uh, and then the independent contractor agreement is um, sometimes, you know, you can still hire independent contractors, but it has become more difficult. Uh, last year, a case came out, Dynamex, and uh, we used to have a, like 10 different factors for determining of whether or not somebody was an independent contractor. And now we've limited it to, the, to three, this ABC test. And um, it comes out of New Jersey. And actually, my dad's best friend, who's kind of like an uncle to me, is a, an employment lawyer out of New Jersey. So we had this discussion on, you know, how would this, how would this work with nurses um, with a couple, of different, my, uh, um, a couple of different clients of mine who hired nurses part-time. And sadly, uh, he thought that they would actually be employees based on those circumstances. I don't know what yours are. But 
um, you know, how much are you controlling them? And obviously, with a doctor's job, he has to supervise the nurses. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of control. Um, second is, um, do they have like outside em employment? And they did, um, but it may not be enough. And then um, the other thing is, is um, are they uh, doing work that's customarily um, engaged, that's independent? And so you have to look at all those uh, three factors and decide if it maybe makes sense to shift them to becoming actually an employee. <clears throat> and then um, the buy-sell agreement, I mentioned that earlier when you have your shareholder agreement, that just helps prevent, uh, prevent disputes if there's ever somebody decides to leave the business or if sadly someone passes, it's good to have that in there. And then um, your business associate agreement, that's related, that's obviously with HIPAA compliance. I've had some people reach out to me for those, even though HIPAA has been around for years and they don't have one in place and you have to have policies and procedures in place to pr protect your patient data and that's what the business associate agreement discusses and if there was ever a problem, it's prudent to have that um, and update it regularly because it's not just HIPAA, but it's high tech as well. Laws. Um, um, you have to be in compliance. And um, then the lease, that's another thing that could be negotiated. A lot of um, even a lot of businesses just think that it's take it or leave it from the landlord, but you could negotiate certain things. My dad is a real estate lawyer. Um, I've worked on 80 page leases with him and um, sometimes, you know, I've been told, oh, they're not, nothing will be negotiable with them, but a lot of things are negotiable, and even when it's 80 pages. So um, those are things to look into. <clears throat> so now that I've just talked about a lot of different contracts, I just wanted to go into some of the terms that are in contracts because we're all, if you're a doctor, you have um, you've got, you know an advanced degree, and you should be able to read your contracts. If, Sometimes the lawyer knows the law, but we don't know the, all the business terms. And so if that's not properly articulated by the client, it can be, uh, it could become problematic. And so, it, I mean, it's fine if I'm working on a contract and another party's a doctor and they've, they've reviewed it and they didn't have a lawyer review it, but um, not when it's my client. I want them to understand the terms. So uh, just some simple things like who are the parties? If you don't know who the other party is and you have a dispute, how are you, it becomes harder to find them. So we need their address. We need to know the right entity. If, um, if you know, in terms of the description of services, sometimes you may be hiring somebody to do remodeling work in your office. Maybe you're hiring uh, for a, a website. Um, there's all sorts of contracts where you may want the services spelled out and you want to take the time up front so that you can manage the expectations and not be disappointed in the end, especially if you're providing the services, then maybe you want to know what the deliverables are so you're not um, you're not required to do more than you're asked, like if you're the sponsor for a company for a medical device or you're being asked to do some marketing services, what if, they're asked, what if they end up asking you more than what, the con what you thought the contract meant? So um, it's all good to have that in the contract and then a timeline for delivery, um, you know, how long is this going to take? Is this tied to a fee schedule? If maybe, you know, if you're paying for it, of course, you probably want to pay at the end once you get what you want, but maybe uh, if you're the one who is um, providing the services, you may want a fee schedule to be paid um, in interim after certain benchmarks are met. And then um, the term and termination, um, that can come up because it just did, my, my client reached out to me and said he entered into this marketing agreement a year ago, and or uh, probably six months ago, and it's for a year, and now he wants to terminate, and based on the contract, um, there's no termination provision. So we had to finesse that situation to get him out so he didn't have to pay for six more months to a company he wasn't, he wasn't happy with. And that could have been avoided by just having that put in. Um, you know, maybe 10 days notice if they're in breach or failing to provide the services um, that he, he had contracted for. So you then obviously having, you know, what is breach, what is default, that, that makes it just so much easier if there is a problem saying, hey, per section 3.2, you are in breach, and it makes it a lot easier rather than having a dispute over, you know, a breach of contract. Um, the confidentiality provision is really important because, especially if it's again dealing with patient data, you have to keep that protected. And so, uh, you want to protect your patient data and put that confidentiality provision in. Indemnification. A lot of people don't know or understand what that means, and um, that that came up actually with a client who. Another marketing company, they had contracted with a marketing company, 
and the marketing company used some photos that they did not provide them permission to use. Um, I, I, the patient was threatening to sue, and if it was the marketing company's fault, they would have wanted an indemnification provision that says that uh, the marketing company will have to pay them for their defense costs. And um, so fortunately, we were able to resolve that issue by getting the marketing company to take it down, and then the patient was happy. But um, having that kind of provision, you know, if you're going to be in entering into a contract, you want to have, you want to be indemnified at the very least. Sometimes it should be a mutual um, to be more fair. And then uh, dispute resolution. But this is a lot of times in contracts I see where it's just under California law. And if you're dealing with patient issues or you want to protect your professional status, you want to use an arbitration provision because while it may be more costly, it could be faster and it could be more private. Um, court is a public record. So if you're doing due diligence on the other party and you want to see if they're litigious, you can look up their litigation history and see all sorts of cases that, that just happened with a client. And we saw lots of cases uh, with their business partner and you know they should have done their due diligence up front. So if you have an arbitration provision, then it would keep it out of state court and it would be less likely that that would make uh, that would become a public record. And then assignment is, is also important. It's something that's often looked over or it's not in the contract. But if you contract with somebody to provide a service and you like their service, you've done your due diligence and then they assign it to somebody else, you're not going to be happy potentially. So that's something else, you know, assignment should be uh, no assignment unless written um, permission, if that's what you want. So next, we're going to go to intellectual property. And um, as related to IP, um, uh, a lot of this, what I'm talking about is actually from an IP, uh, intellectual property 101 video that is on Law Takes website. I mention it because I did help with the script, so I'm not infringing on the copyright. But it's done by two other attorneys, and it's a great video to just talk about uh, copyright, trademarks, trade secrets, and patents. And so I suggest that you check out that video if you want some basic information. And then there's also a video on how to obtain a patent. Um, but I will just briefly say that copyright, um, you can register your copyright. You can put the C on your website. As you can see, the copyright logo on the bottom of this um, PowerPoint slide I did for mine, and then you want to put that on your before and afters and on your website content. There's actually a recent um, case that came out of Florida regarding copyrights for uh, before and afters, and my friend is actually uh, part of the team that's litigating that before the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, for some reason, the judge held that copyrights, um, it was not protected for before and after that was infringed on by another company, which is crazy to me in California because so much work goes into the before and afters. You use special lighting. Some of the, some doctors have professional photographers come in. They you know all the angles. So you want to protect your before and afters by putting your logo on it. And then um, related to your logo, you can trademark it. That could be your name. That could be um, a name for a service that you've come up with. For example, um, I'm friends with Dr. Charles Reynolds. He has the Vampire Facial, the Vampire Facelift. And he protects his trademarks. One of my clients got a cease and desist from him, and um, we were able to work that out. She's calling it microneedling with PRP, and that's one of the ways by you know by not using that trademark name unless you have a license from him to use it. Um, that that would be a workaround. Trade secrets. Um, that is stuff that you have to keep confidential, like your patient list, in order for it to maintain it as a trade secret. Um, your financials methods that you use. So just put your com confidentiality provisions in your contract to maintain that. And if there's ever a dispute over that sort of information, you can say it was a trade secret or you would argue it was a trade secret. Patents. I'm not a patent attorney, but I work with them. If you come up with a design and utility patent, um, then you should maybe look into uh, a patent. And then there's a video about that that will go into it. And um, like I said, considerations for all intellectual property is um, obviously, obtaining and registering, protecting, and maintaining the confidentiality, but also monetizing through licensing. So, like I had mentioned earlier, if you have the management services agreement, you can license your intellectual property that way. Maybe if you're doing uh, co-branding with a you know medical device company or cosmetics company, there can be a license agreement. So it's a way to monetize your brand. Okay, now I'm going to talk about how to avoid disputes. I know I had mentioned a little bit about it, but 
I um, just wanted to recognize um, Michael Cohen. He is um, he has a great healthcare law blog, and I used to work for him as of counsel to his firm. And um, he ha I wrote my first demand letter with him. He taught me how to write my first demand letter, and then also respond to a demand letter. Though I had worked in house and respond to um, I had responded to grievance complaints before, but um, he has really great information to pro to avoid disputes on his website. So I highly recommend subscribing and he puts out a good newsletter. So in a nutshell though, how can you avoid disputes? Uh, there's been some studies for, you know, regarding doctors and malpractice claims. And I guess uh, there's some consensus that it's bedside manner, that it's communication, empathy, spending a little bit more time up front. So those, that just, that goes beyond just patient care. That just goes to, in general, you want to communicate um, with your, you know, parties if you're having an issue and try to work things out. If you can't communicate, then you need to delegate that to somebody who can. But um, you can have contracts that have proper disclosures, informed consent, um, calendar reminders regarding termination provisions. Um, I mentioned the doctor who reached out to me regarding um, the clause that, or his contract that he he had to, had to have in place for a year. There was no termination provision. Well, it can go the opposite. I had a client reach out to me because he had a marketing agreement and it was for a year. Um, and if they wanted to terminate it, they had to give 30 days notice or it was going to renew for another year. And they never set a calendar reminder. And of course, then, you know, this was like a $25,000 a year contract. It wasn't cheap. So after a whole year went by, they didn't want to continue, but they had failed to terminate. So the other party had instituted an arbitration proceedings that I had to assist with getting them out of. And so um, calendar reminders are so simple and that's something that you need to put in place when you enter into these contracts. Um, another technique would be the good cop, bad cop. If you are the one who has made a patient upset, then you're the bad cop and you don't want to deal with them. You want to have a good cop try to deal with them or have your attorney be the bad cop and have your practice be the good cop because um, you want to try to avoid litigation. It's costly, it's time consuming, it zaps you of your energy. And um, the other thing is that, you know, maybe, maybe my entrepreneurial um, startup clients and not in the healthcare space might um, ask for, 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 for forgiveness rather than permission, but it goes a long way. Just you can um, figure out sometimes ways to get permission without ruining your chances of doing what you want to do and that's a good way to avoid disputes. Um, other common sense besides uh, communication that I, I had mentioned was customer service, obviously um, striving for patient, patient care. Um, this one is so simple, but I see people missing out on it all the time, approaching from a place of abundance, not scarcity. There's all sorts of pa potential patients out there, business, if it's not the right, if it's not a good idea for you to do a procedure, then don't do it. Um, I went to a great medical seminar that said, uh, uh, Dr. Krauss gave a uh, presentation in it and he talked about how the TSA can um, use techniques to screen people, or they cannot use techniques, the doctors can. So uh, use those techniques, figure out if, if this is maybe not the right fit because they may have body dysmorphia issues or they um, may have complained about a lot of previous doctors. And so maybe you need to just not turn, not work with them and turn them away. Um, and I did actually write an article that I didn't mention before on how to deal with difficult clients, but a lot of it's just similar with dealing with patients. And so you can check out that article. Um, if you can't avoid dispute, hopefully you have insurance. And there's not just malpractice insurance, but um, there's also general business liability if somebody falls on the premises. There's E&O, which could be useful for healthcare billing. Um, um, DNO, directors and officers insurance, and that's come into play when uh, if you have a number of uh, directors of your professional medical corp and you think you might be sued for a breach of fiduciary duty or contract or um, whatnot, then you might, may want to have DNO insurance. Employment practices insurance, products liability, and workers' compensation are obviously also things you should consider and you should talk to your insurance broker about those and have his policies um, reviewed by your attorney, they are negotiable. And then um, before I abandon you all for Jacob to speak, I'm gonna talk about avoiding patient abandonment issues. Um, I had a client ask me, um, you know, how should they handle this, this disgruntled patient 
and they had emailed them, um, you know, this kind of nasty, it wasn't really nasty, just, just not very kind letter um, or email saying, you know, you said you were going to go, you weren't happy here, and, you know, you want a prescription, go to your new doctor. And that doesn't take into account some of the rules for patient abandonment. So I suggested that they instead write something that was more um, t working towards um, patient patient care, even though that person may not have been a lovely patient to work with. And so that is just a template to use. It obviously needs to be tailored to your own practice, but there's rules about providing um, emergency care and then obviously um, maybe helping them with a the referral. So you need to take those things into consideration before you just terminate the doctor-patient relationship. And then um, that's pretty much everything. If you have We'll, have, we'll do some questions at the end, and um, those are some ways to connect with me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thank you. Well, Suzanne, thank you. That was a lot of information well, well presented. Uh, we all appreciate it. If you will give me one thank quick you. second, I'm going to switch to my presentation. Okay. Very good. Okay, so again, uh, Suzanne and Bonnie, thank you. Uh, Suzanne is a healthcare lawyer, and any healthcare um, questions, regulatory questions, how to structure a medical practice, she is uh, the person uh, to speak to. My own practice, I'm Jacob Stein, focuses on uh, private wealth work, meaning that we work with. Uh, wealthy individuals and wealthy families to help them structure their affairs, to minimize taxation, to avoid claims uh, by third-party creditors, to help transition the transfer of wealth to uh, younger generations. And for doctors, and we represent um, a lot of doctors uh, in our practice, uh, a lot of the work focuses on protecting assets from claims of third-party creditors. So what sort of creditors uh, would a doctor uh, or a surgical center or even a hospital have? And we have represented over the years literally hundreds of doctors, uh, healthcare groups, surgical centers, hospitals, medical nonprofits, you, you name it. Uh, doctors, in my experience, uh, have two types of claims. One, uh, which is the obvious one, is um, a claim for malpractice, right? Uh, so you have a patient, uh, there is some sort of a, an act of negligence or at least an alleged act of negligence. Perhaps it is gross negligence uh, and there is a lawsuit uh, by the patient against the doctor, against the medical group. So that's one. Two would be something that's not sort of directly related to the practice of medicine. Uh, for example, uh, in over the past year we have represented uh, We've represented a lot of doctors facing the Me Too uh, lawsuits. So perhaps these are lawsuits uh, by staff, uh, staff at the hospital, staff working directly for the doctor, uh, alleging some sort of uh, sexual misconduct, uh, harassment, discrimination. Uh, we also represent a lot of doctors involved in car accidents. In my experience, and I do not know why, but doctors uh, and generally make for poor drivers. Perhaps the doctors are just overworked, tired, uh, you know, being distracted by uh, urgent texts on their phone and so forth, but uh, a lot of accidents involving doctors. Uh, just recently, we had a doctor client. Uh, he was a fairly young uh, man. He was in his mid-40s, a doctor uh, driving to his office early in the morning, passed out, passed out while driving, uh, and while he passed out, he ran uh, first into a pedestrian, then into another car. And uh, he unfortunately uh, not just struck a pedestrian, but he killed a pedestrian while he was passed out. He went through a battery of tests, and they could never figure out why it is that he passed out. But the pedestrian he happened to run over and kill was a CEO of a fairly large company. And the doctor got hit with a $30 million wrongful death loss it. Um, so we see a lot of these types of cases and often, uh, surprisingly, we see that our doctor clients are underinsured. 
so they may not have uh, sufficient automobile insurance coverage. Maybe they have like just the state limits or something low, like $100,000. And nowadays, $100,000 is not enough uh, to cover most damages, especially healthcare claims for injuries uh, that may be the result of an accident. And uh, we often see doctors don't carry enough of an umbrella coverage. So my first suggestion to our doctor clients is to up your insurance coverage. It's a very inexpensive way of protecting your assets. Uh, the amount of coverage, uh, which comes up often, uh, when we're talking about an umbrella policy, I would suggest buying the maximum that you can buy. Umbrella insurance is not expensive. Even like uh, three, four, five million dollars of coverage a year should cost less than a thousand dollars. And certainly for uh, an umbrella policy, I would just get absolutely the most that I can. And I personally have as well. Uh, for automobile insurance, I would say minimum of half a million um, of uh, coverage. Right? That should be enough to cover most types of um, accidents, but not all. And as far as malpractice insurance for your coverage, as you may know, under various state laws, including under California law, there are certain limitations on uh, malpractice claims against doctors, but those limitations do not apply all the time. And there are quite a few cases that we see where there is a claim against uh, a doctor for malpractice that is not subject to the limitations. Maybe it's, let's say, uh, gross negligence uh, or something like that. Uh, and, uh, you know, then the claim can be for any amount that the plaintiff's attorney has in mind. Um, so what do we do to protect our uh, client's um, assets? Uh, I'm going to move uh, straight ahead to plan uh, to slide number four, mark number four. And this is planning for uh, a doctor who may be married and living in a community property state, a state like California, because in states like California and community property states, we do end up doing some different planning, especially for a married couple. Uh, so let's say that we have a, a doctor client Let's say uh, the wife is the doctor, and uh, I'll just use a recent uh, example. We had a client recently, a general surgeon. Uh, he did a gallbladder surgery on a patient, and the patient uh, died a few days after the surgery. And of course, a wrongful death lawsuit was filed, uh, and the lawsuit for malpractice was filed against the doctor. Now, it's still very early in the lawsuit. It's still very early in the fact-finding phase of the lawsuit. Uh, so we do not yet know if the doctor will be held to be at fault and there will be judgment against the doctor, but there may be, right? So even at this early stage, once we know that there is an existing claim, and especially if the lawsuit has already been filed, uh, we should be doing something uh, to protect assets. So if that doctor happens to live in a community property state, what do we do? Well, in this case, the doctor is the wife the wife is the surgeon, uh, and the husband is not a doctor. The husband actually happens to be uh, a professor at a local university. So the doctor, the wife, is the one with exposure to claims, risk exposure, right? Whereas the university professor is part of his profession, of his uh, you know, daily job, does not really have a lot of liability exposure, right? The university professors are, do not that often get Sued. Um, so, in uh, so planning for a couple like that, one of the first things we will look to do is to create separate property assets. So, we would take some assets and make them separate, the separate property of the husband, the the spouse who is not being sued, and some assets will be made the separate property of the wife, the one who is being sued. Why are we doing this? Well, under community property laws, when one of the spouses is being sued, all of the community property assets are exposed to that lawsuit. Not just 50%, 100% of the community property assets are exposed to that lawsuit. So when one of my doctor clients is being sued, we aim to create separate property assets because whatever separate property is being transferred to the other spouse, should not be reachable by the creditors of the spouse that is being sued. 
So we will take a look at the spouse's assets and we will divide them up. Some assets become separate property of the wife and some assets become the separate property of the husband. Uh, there is a bit of an art as to how we pick and choose which assets we are dividing and which assets go to which spouse. Like who gets the house, who gets the cash, who gets the various retirement plans, interests in legal entities and income producing real estate and so forth. Uh, so I'm not going to get into that now. That's a very specific and detailed discussion. But I will just say that we do want it to be an equal split based on the value of assets so that each spouse is getting an equal amount of assets. Um, and that also, you know, first of all, that makes it more difficult for a plaintiff to challenge the division of assets. And also it does not uh, create any sort of a, of a conflict between the two spouses. So we wouldn't want to transfer, let's say, all of the assets to the other spouse, or in this case, to the university professor, because if we transfer all of the assets to the other spouse, there is the risk that the other spouse will say, hey, I have all the assets. It's been nice knowing you. Bye, right? Um, because whatever agreement uh, we have our client center into, these agreements are enforceable for all legal purposes. So for a married couple, first thing we do is we split up community property into separate property. And that is uh, the agreement that accomplishes that is commonly known as a transmutation agreement, transmutation. We are transmuting community property into separate property. So that's number one. Number two, we are looking at the other assets that uh, they happen to have. And again, just because of the limited amount of time we have today, uh, I'm going to kind of jump ahead uh, to slide number 18 and I kind of put together a list of the assets that these clients happen to have. These are real life uh, clients. And I will kind of walk you through what we did uh, for uh, these clients. Um, so uh, these clients have assets that are somewhat typical um, of most of us, maybe not necessarily by the value of the asset, but uh, by the composition, right? We, we, a lot of our uh, clients uh, have a personal residence that has some equity in it. Some of them will have either a professional practice or some other business that they own that also has value. Maybe there is income producing real estate. Maybe there are some liquid assets like cash and investment accounts. Maybe there's some money in the retirement plan. So the first thing, as I said, is the transmutation agreement, right? Um, so one of the spouses gets, uh, in this example, the retirement plan and the medical practice. The other spouse gets uh, the real estate and the cash. And, uh, you know, we, we had to adjust the numbers here a little bit so they work out. But again, the focus is to make sure that each spouse gets the same amount of assets. So now let's talk about some more interesting stuff. What do we do from here? So first of all, uh, the retirement plan. The retirement plan, depending on the nature of the plan, may be wholly exempt from creditor claims. So if we have a retirement plan uh, that is uh, an ERISA qualified plan, um, then uh, the ERISA qualified plan is exempt from creditor claims under federal law so long as there is at least one employee participating in the plan. Okay, there you have to have at least one employee who is not an owner of the business, not an owner of the medical practice, uh, participating in the plan. And then it's just absolutely exempt from credit claims. What if you do not have an ERISA qualified plan? What if you have an IRA? Um, IRAs are not ERISA qualified plans, and IRAs here includes you know, all types of IRAs regular IRAs, Roth IRAs, SEP IRAs, uh, solo IRAs, what have you. Um, IRAs are not protected under federal law. They may be protected under state law, and this will vary from state to state. So for example, uh, if you are in Texas uh, or in Florida, your IRAs are entirely exempt from credit claims. But if you're in California, for most of our clients, your IRA is not exempt, meaning it is reachable by your creditors. So a lot of our doctor clients do set up retirement plans. So our advice to them commonly is, if possible, do not set up an IRA. Instead, uh, set up a 401k plan. Um, if you do have an existing IRA, 
you may want to consider rolling it over into a 401k plan so that the retirement funds that you have are exempt from credit claims. Okay, so that's a retirement plan. Moving on, uh, many, many of our clients have a personal residence that they own, right? They're not renters. And often this personal residence has equity in it. So what do we do? Well, California law does protect some amount of equity, but it's not a lot. It's gonna be about $125,000 of equity uh, protected under California law for most of us. Uh, and in some other states, it may be higher. So for example, if you live in Nevada, it's 500,000. And if you live in Texas or Florida, it's unlimited by value. But in most other states, it is significantly limited. So your residence, and I think this is very surprising for many of our clients, your residence is reachable by your creditors. So how would you want to own your residence? Well, I think the main idea, the main kind of value we advocate here is to have the residence not be in our client's name. What do we mean by that? So either have the other spouse own the residence. So in our example, right, the doctor, the wife is the one who is uh, uh, likely to be sued. The husband is not. So perhaps we can make the residence the separate property of the husband so that when the wife is being sued, she no longer owns the residence. It is now owned by the husband. Uh, again, we accomplished that with the transmutation agreement, which is fairly uh, straightforward uh, and fairly inexpensive to accomplish. So that gets the residence out of the wife's name. What else can we do to get the residence out of the wife's name? Well, the next thing we can do is to perhaps transfer the ownership of the residence out of the name of both spouses. And most commonly that is accomplished by transferring the ownership of the residence to an irrevocable trust. So on this slide, I call it a QPERT, which stands for Qualified Personal Residence Trust, which is a, a tax concept. But it doesn't need to be this kind of irrevocable trust. It can be pretty much any irrevocable trust that is structured for the purpose of asset protection. Um, when people for the first time hear about irrevocable trusts, it's uh, a concept that comes across as being a bit scary, right? We do not want to do something that is irrevocable. We want to preserve the right to change our mind. We want to preserve the right to get our residents back into our name tomorrow. And rest assured, you can do that. With a well-drafted irrevocable trust, you can preserve the ability to get your assets back, whether it's a residence or any other asset. You can make changes to the trust. It is not cast in stone. What irrevocable means in a modern trust is that a third party creditor cannot force you to revoke the trust. You can if you choose to do so, which is a huge distinction. So it used to be that irrevocable trusts were truly irrevocable. That is not the case uh, anymore, and it's not a scary concept. We can also draft an irrevocable trust in such a way so that there are no tax consequences, uh, no income tax, no estate tax, no gift tax. We can make sure that there is no property tax consequences. We can make sure there is no triggering of the mortgage when you transfer to the trust. So it's a fairly simple and straightforward proposition. And I will tell you that over the course of my career, I've set up hundreds of irrevocable trusts for clients' residences. It is a structure that works really well. And as a matter of fact, I use a trust like that for my own residence. It works really, really well. Uh, and by the way, let me kind of step back for a second right now and tell you that there is no structure that works like a magic wand meaning a structure that's 100% foolproof, right? Any and every structure can be uh, challenged by uh, a creditor. And it's just a question of what is their likelihood of success, uh, which is why we advocate always that our clients set up these structures well ahead, well ahead uh, of something bad happening before there is a, uh, a malpractice claim. Maybe even before you see that patient that may generate malpractice claim before there is a car accident because if you do the planning today before you have someone with a claim against you before you have a creditor the odds of success are in much much higher like incredibly higher uh, so plan today you can set up much simpler structures a lot less expensive and there will be much higher likelihood of success okay so that's the personal residence um, for the Income producing real estate, in this example, they have an apartment building. Uh, 
real estate usually does not go into an irrevocable trust if it is income producing real estate because our clients need to retain access to the income that the real estate generates instead real estate will go either into a limited liability company or perhaps a limited partnership sometimes what's called a family limited partnership uh, and then there are some other structures available like what's called a private retirement plan um, you know we pick and choose these structures for each particular client depending on how well they want to protect their assets, depending on uh, their appetite for uh, legal fees, their appetite for complexity, and so forth. And then finally, cash and securities. Uh, for these clients, we actually protect it with an offshore structure. Uh, once there is a lawsuit, and remember here the clients came to us because there's already an existing malpractice claim against the, the doctor spouse, once there is an existing claim, uh, we really need to set up structures that are a lot more robust. So in this case, for the liquid security, for the cash and the liquid securities, we set up an offshore structure and we actually move the cash and the securities offshore uh, to an investment, uh, an investment advisory firm in Europe. So in practice, you know what happens as a result of doing all of this? We're doing this work very often last minute. I mean, it, doctor clients that we have are usually fairly good at planning ahead of time because doctors tend to be more risk averse by nature than the average population out there. Perhaps that's why you guys go to medical school, right? But very often clients come to us once something bad has happened, right? Once they've been in a car accident, once there's been a malpractice claim, once they've defaulted on a loan that they signed a personal guarantee on. And it's not too late to plan when that happens. It's not. It's just we need to pursue structures that are more aggressive to have the same likelihood of success. Uh, but, but it still, still works. And we will pursue more aggressive structures. And what will the plaintiff do? Well, the plaintiff will have a choice. They can challenge what we have done uh, to protect our client's assets, or they can settle with our client. If they choose to challenge, it means they need to file a separate lawsuit for what's called a fraudulent transfer and challenge the transfer of the assets that our clients have into the asset protection structures that we have set up. Uh, we see that happening about 2% of the time, not that often. Very rarely do we see creditors challenge the structures that we have set up. Most of the time, what we see happening is that plaintiffs will uh, choose to settle, negotiate and settle with our clients, uh, which uh, is exactly the result that we want. And because our clients' assets are now a lot more difficult to reach, uh, we are settling on terms that are a lot more favorable to our clients. And this is where having insurance, by the way, becomes extremely useful, right? Because we can give the plaintiff that carrot of the insurance coverage saying, here, our client has malpractice insurance, our client has an umbrella policy, take that. You're going to have a very difficult job going after our client's assets because they're sitting inside of asset protection structures. Let's settle. We'll pay you a little bit something to incentivize you to walk away, but don't come after our client's assets. And the vast, vast majority of the time, that is exactly what uh, transpires. Uh, final point for uh, today is estate planning. Uh, I think doctors, for whatever reason, uh, and I think that's very similar to lawyers, are really bad at doing estate planning for themselves. Estate planning uh, does not focus on protecting assets. It's more kind of everyday stuff like avoiding probate, uh, providing for uh, what happens if there's an incapacity event, appointing guardians for minor children, uh, having health care directives in place. Uh, just uh, stuff that we all do not want to think about, although perhaps for doctors it's easier since you guys confront mortality more often than the rest of us, uh, but it has to be addressed, especially if you do have more significant assets, and certainly if you have uh, kids, you need to engage in estate planning. A typical estate plan will have uh, what's called a living trust. This is the vehicle that's gonna hold most of your assets, and in addition to the living trust, there will be wills and healthcare directors, uh, directives. Uh, living wills, uh, powers of, a, of attorney, um, and so forth. 
uh, everyone, I think, who has some assets, and certainly everyone who has kids should have an estate plan. And then what we will do for our doctor clients is if we are doing estate planning for them, we will try to figure out is, you know, is it possible for us to add some asset protection elements to the estate plan and make it into what is commonly known as an integrated estate plan, meaning we're integrating asset protection into estate planning. So I think that's all the time I have to, uh, for my portion of the presentation. We do have some questions that have come in. And as a reminder, uh, if you're listening live to this presentation, uh, you do have the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, so you can type in questions. If you did not have a chance to ask us questions directly, uh, you do have uh, the email addresses for both me and for Suzanne, more importantly. And you can email, uh, email us questions at any time. Just say that, hey, you know, Suzanne, I have uh, attended your presentation. I listened to your presentation. I have a question. Can you help me with this? And both of us will be very happy uh, to help you guys uh, answer questions. So for now, the questions that have come in, let me take a look. Suzanne, I think the first one is for you. Okay. My malpractice insurer gave me some sample legal forms to use in my practice. Or should I be using those forms or should I have them reviewed by a lawyer? Uh, the answer is yes. You should have them reviewed by a lawyer. They're very generic. They are not tailored to your practice. Um, they don't answer specifics. Your pra There's very different types of medical practices out there and they're usually a little bit generic. And so it's uh, better than starting with nothing. But uh, in terms of the handbooks that you need in place, the uh, agreements that inform consent. I mean, there's a lot of, maybe you're offering cutting edge types of procedures and services and it's not um, properly uh, depicted in those forms. So yes, I suggest having them reviewed. It doesn't take that long, but sometimes um, just some, uh, and then sometimes doctors do want to, are more businessy. They want to promote their procedures and the informed consent, unfortunately, need to be the opposite. They need to be telling them all the risks. So yes, they should uh, have them reviewed. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, if I have a home I want to protect from creditors, am I better off using a trust or an LLC? I think that's for me. Uh, we protect homes, uh, like a personal residence, primarily by using a trust and not an LLC. There are some specific reasons for that that are a little bit beyond the scope of today's presentation, but primarily we use trusts. Uh, if I have a problem with a patient, should I always reach out to the malpractice insurer? Suzanne, that's that's for you. Um, well, the, your insurance is going to have rules about when, if you want that policy to kick in for them to pay your defense, then any time a patient makes any monetary demand, you should just put your, your insurance carrier on notice. Obviously, if you get a, a complaint or a notice of arbitration or anything, um, of a legal capacity like that, you definitely need to put them on notice. The whole point is so you're paying these premiums so they'll, they'll uh, pay for the defense if it's related to something covered under the policy. So um, it doesn't necessarily increase your premium if you just put them on notice saying, okay, we got this demand for a refund and we're handling it. We don't think it'll accelerate, something like that. Yeah, and I believe also that if you do not notify them, they may have the right not to cover the claim. Right. Exactly. Um, I want to include a special cosmetic as a product line for my practice. How should I go about doing that? Um, so if you are um, a physician and you're considering uh, as a you know, business opportunity to, con to include a cosmetic line, you can maybe uh, include your own or you can, you can come up with branding or you can um, offer, obviously, other cosmetics, a lot of um, medical-grade cosme cosmeceuticals um, that are out there. And you can, obviously, you just want to make sure that whatever uh, claims that if you're using another company, um, maybe you're offering Obagi or something, then make sure that the claims they're making you've also checked into, um, that you don't want to get in trouble for false claims. Um, the FDA doesn't just go after manufacturers. The oversight is for... Um, there's, you know, false advertising issues as well, and you don't want to be deceitful with any of the claims on um, in your advertising of these products or what's on the products you're offering them. So there are some considerations. If you're going to develop your own brand, uh, that's a whole other business venture, then uh, maybe you need to create a whole separate entity to handle that um, besides just offering that in your own, uh, through your own professional medical corp. 
So a bunch of different considerations, but it's, it's advised as a, a good opportunity to be connected with your patients when they're not just in the office. Got it. Thank you. Uh, and then we have, well, a couple of questions that are related, so let me aggregate them. One is, what's the most common type of entity for doctors in California? And the other one says, uh, if a doctor is using a corporation, can it be a regular corporation or must it be a professional medical corporation? So my understanding is that uh, professionals like doctors have to use professional corporations uh, in California, and that's really the only entity available to doctors. Uh, what do you say, Suzanne? Yeah, professional medical corporation. They have to, if they're practicing medicine, then they can either be uh, a solo or they can have a partnership. Or if they want the entity, it has to be a professional medical corporation. There are no LLCs for doctors practicing medicine. It's related to the corporate practice of medicine. We do not want lay people influencing doctors. And the professional medical corps are regulated by the medical board, so they make sure that they're doctors that are the shareholders and and stuff like that. So yeah. Um, and what's the com most common in California? Um, it would if there, there's only one answer. If there's uh, most, what's the most common entity? It has to be a professional medical corp. Although there may be tons of solos and partnerships. Cool. Uh, next question I think is for me. Can a solo 401k plan with one participant have asset protection? Uh, the answer is not in uh, California. It will be treated like an IRA, so it would not be exempt from credit claims. You need to have employees participating in the plan uh, to have ERISA protection. Um, would there be an issue with regard to the transmutation agreement of the loss that has been filed or about to be? Well, anything we do last minute can be challenged, right? So it's hard to say how effective it will be uh, but often if the split of the assets is equal and often if we can come up with a good reason uh, for uh, having the spouse and spouses enter into the transmutation, uh, it still may work. Okay, final question. Uh, can you please email us the slides? It must be someone who is not re looking at their screen. Uh, as we have said right below there on the screen, uh, you guys will get uh, your CLE certificates and the course materials by email. Uh, our our uh, staff will email it out to you guys. If you are an accountant um, and you would like a CPE certificate, then please email Natasha. We have the email address right there on the slide, uh, and she will email you the CPE certificate. With that, guys, thank you so much for attending yet another Aligned webinar. Uh, Suzanne Nadboni, thank you so much for participating and offering your valuable comments. You're welcome, and thank you. Take care, yeah. everyone. Bye. Take care, everyone. Have a great day.